So I'm really excited to introduce uh, Brad Frost. He is a renowned design system consultant, front-end developer, and international speaker. Um, as the principal and technical consultant at Big Medium, Brad has been instrumental in assisting teams establish, in establishing and evolving their design systems and facilitating collaboration. Brad authored um, an influential book, you might have heard of it, Atomic Design, um, and that presents a methodology and empowers organizations to build and sustain effective design systems. So uh, today in his talk title is Atomic Design Dead, uh, Brad will share the success stories, lessons learned, and insights on the past, present, and future of design systems. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brad. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? See me okay? Okay. Excellent. Oh, you want me to grab? Okay. All right, cheers. How the hell's it going? Yay! All right, I am excited to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you all. I hope you like my clipbait uh, title of my talk, Is Atomic Design Dead? That's to get the butts in the seats, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but yeah, we are here. I am super excited to be here. Uh, uh, I'm really excited to learn a bunch about uh, design systems from the rest of the speakers. But what I would love for you to join me on is taking a little trip with me. Take a little trip. So let's go. Oh, can I not get the audio? Hang on one second. That's not good. You can't get the audio. Do, do, do. do you hear me? Take a little trip. Take a little trip with me. There we go. There we go. Thank you for indul indulging me. OK, ready? Websites. Once upon a time, there are these things called websites. Right? 1991, first website. How about that? Right? So we got a way to disseminate information to the world. And how we go about making those things was you just freaking do it. Right? GeoCities, right? Anybody? GeoCities, Angel Fire, right? All of that stuff. Eventually, if people figure out, hey, we could take Photoshop and this thing called the Slice Tool, things like Image Ready, and we could slice up our graphics and then convert those into a website, right? Anybody nostalgic for those days? Cutting out four separate images for a border radius, right, in order to make a rounded corner? Amazing. Then this internet thing, it's kind of like, you know, we're talking like mid-90s here, right? So 94, 95, this internet thing, hey, this is starting to catch on. This isn't going away. So now we're going to have two websites, right? Our, our main website and then our intranet, right? So now we're like, OK, all right. So now we need sort of a way to create consistency between these two websites, right? So how do we do that? Well, we got these vague ass brand style guides, right? As a here's our logo, here's the white space for them, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the colors, use these for the buttons. Thank you very much, right? Web 2.0, Ajax, jQuery, 2005, right? 2004, 2005, Macromedia Flex, Flash. The glory days, folks, right? So there's more websites. Oh, we now have a web app. A web app with more Photoshop, right? 2007. Steve Jobs standing on stage. One more thing. Da da da. Here's a thing called the iPhone, right? Android comes out. The next year, they launch the App Store and Google Play Store. So more digital products, right? More Photoshop. And more brand style guides. Although, like for native stuff, it was just the brand style guide was like, just throw all of that in the trash can and do whatever you want because this is a brand new thing, brand new paradigm. We're figuring it out, right? 2010, Sketch comes along, starts eating into Photoshop's share. No more slicing and dicing, right? We now have this interface tool, this Mac based interface tool that is like, oh, okay, this is pretty, pretty good stuff. 
2011, Bootstrap and Foundation by Zurb. Remember that one? Right? And then here's this thing that's like, oh yeah, you could kind of have these components and you could kind of copy and paste these things uh, into uh, your application. And the fun thing is, is that the designers don't know that the developers are using it. So, you know, they're continuing to do their whatever the hell they're doing. And then the developers are like, I'm going to take this square peg and this round hole and hack the shit out of it, right? And it's kind of around this time, right? So also just sort of fun facts, like, you know, web components kind of were introduced in 2011, NPM sort of just back, you know, in the backdrop, right? Backdrop of things. But it's also kind of at this stage, we're talking like 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, we have people like Natalie Down that are starting to talk about more sort of uh, modular-based CSS. 2009, Nathan Curtis, who a lot of us know and love, came out with a book called Modular Web Design, which is like absolutely crazy that this was like well ahead of its time. By this point, probably the, the only kind of like really well-known pattern library out there was this thing called YUI by the team at Yahoo, but it was this Yahoo interface guidelines. But then also things like CSS methodologies are coming on the scene. 2010, 2011, 2010, BEM was created by the team at uh, Yandex or something. I can't remember, Russian company. Uh, 2011, Nicole Sullivan, object-oriented CSS. 2012, Jonathan Snook, Smacks, right? And all of a sudden, these things start poking up, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, there's this, this idea of modularity that's kind of coming on the scene. And a lot of this is because 2010, Ethan Marcotte came out with this idea called responsive web design, right? As a way of sort of handling how to create digital experiences that sort of work well across small screens, tablet size screens, desktop screens, and everything in between, right? So here we have this thing that could start sort of powering and sort of people can copy and paste some HTML and CSS in order to get a sort of similar look and feel. 2011, 2012, 2013, frameworks like Angular and React start coming on the scene. I actually learned that uh, React was announced two days after I announced Atomic Design. So that was a little bit of fun synergy. So we got more products, more web apps powered by these JavaScript frameworks, right? And then on the design side, rather than just having these vague ass brand style guides anymore, there start to become these, these uh, Photoshop uh, <laughs> and sketch based sort of UI kits, right? Here's like your accordion, here's your form controls and so on and so forth, right? Okay, <laughs> what happens next? Well, React explodes for sure over the next number of years, right? 2015, 2016, 2017, React, 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 React. But then in 2015, this thing called ES modules comes out, right? Ships to the browsers, which actually sort of allows for people to sort of actually ship modularized sort of JavaScript, right? Which allows for the creation of like a React library, a React UI library that's actually being able to be directly consumed by these React applications. So you can now have a button that actually is coming from another library and actually sort of directly consume that in an application, which is, ah, that's a big deal. That's our first solid line here, right? And then from there, right, more stuff, more frameworks, more software getting built and more things. And you could kind of have these libraries that are starting to power these things. They're all sort of powered by the same general pattern library, right? and are sort of looking for, you know, the sort of front end sort of source of truth. And at the end of the day, we've kind of learned that it's like, oh, the React one is the source of truth. And then you sort of copy and paste that over for Angular and any other sort of language that we're trying to support, right? 2016, Figma comes on the scene. Puts, puts Photoshop finally in its grave and, and that's okay. And then the following year, 2017, both Sketch and Figma released this thing called Libraries. It's like, it took a solid, <laughs> oh, what, close to 40 years of user interface design 
that eventually the toll maker said, holy shit, guys, do you know that designers need to work with other designers? And like, that's crazy, right? We should probably do something about that, right? So, 2017, that's like six years ago, everyone. That is nuts, right? So here we are, right? So we got, okay, so more like pattern-based stuff. We get, you know, design stuff happening. We got development stuff happening. And that's kind of around 2014, 15, 16, that all of this starts, it's like, oh, you know what? This is all kind of doing the same thing, right? You have this thing called a design system that starts to emerge, right? Again, 2014, 2015, 2016. 2016 is the first Clarity Conference. Gina Ann is out there sort of promoting design systems. I already happened to write this book called Atomic Design, which came out in 2015. And as I was like writing the last chapter, I remember sort of going back through the book and updating sort of pattern library to design system. I remember that, like sitting in a coffee shop, just kind of doing a find and replace because this term started emerging, right? It was pretty wild, right? There's this thing, rather than just kind of like this UX documentation coming along, it's like, oh, we could actually now sort of reference our components and sort of bundle these things up and reference our designs and our design spec as well as, as our code stuff, right? 2016 was also a year of design tokens. Again, more Gina uh, influence. She was working at uh, Salesforce on their lightning design system. And it's like, here's this sort of definition of a visual language, right? Like the translation of those vague ass brand style guides, right? Into actionable user interface to values that could be used in our design tools. They could be used in our code libraries. They could be referenced in the reference website. And they could even travel to these non-web environments. So you're like, oh, OK. So now we could sort of say Starbucks green is Starbucks green, and then sort of deploy Starbucks green to all of these places, right? So we're managing our sort of visual look and feel from one source of truth, which is pretty exciting. What happens next? Well, more stuff. <laughs> more apps, more products, but also different things, right? We got Vue, we got Svelte, we got Solid, we got just all these different things. React Native, we got more software as a service kind of things that we're trying to support. We're trying to figure out how the hell to make all of this work. And it's kind of through this lens that despite being initially conceived in 2011, we have web components kind of hitting the scene in like 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 especially. And what this does is kind of simplifies things, right? Rather than having this sort of referenceable front end code or a, a platform or framework specific version of a component library in code, what we can now do is actually deploy these web components that are part of the web platform to any website, irrespective of the tech stack that they're running, right? If it's a WordPress site, web components can go there. If it's a Drupal site, things could go there, right? Web components could go anywhere. They could be fed into React applications. They could be fed into Angular applications and Vue applications and anything that can run in the browser because these things are part of the web. So now we actually have an honest to God source of truth for our front end code. And that is really, really exciting. And then uh, also around, you know, whatever, last couple years, and I'm sure that you all know this better than I do, Figma continues to just totally eat Sketch's lunch, <laughs> right? And so that sort of goes away. And so, okay, so things are starting to look kind of a little bit simpler, but also, more straight lines instead of those dotted lines, right? We're not just like referencing things anymore. These things are actually starting to get more and more connected. In tools, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, there's a uh, tool called Zero Height. Um, and it's pretty cool, actually. Um, but what it does is allows you to sort of suck up your Figma, Figma files and suck up your storybooks and all that good stuff and actually sort of display the stuff co-located under one roof, right? And so now, ooh, okay, now we have a lot of solid lines. Now we have this sort of interconnected system. But all the while, all of these different software products 
have their own needs, have their own goals, have their own whatever. And so over the last number of years, we sort of introduced this idea of like kind of like recipes or we sometimes called like child design systems or product specific design systems or whatever it might be. But the idea is that let's say you have a marketing website, right? And that marketing website has a header, a global header, right? And that header needs to be used consistently across the entire marketing site. Right? Or maybe you're an e-commerce site. One of these apps is an e-commerce site, and they want to have a product card. Right? And that product card could be using the design system's components, but that specific composition, that specific recipe, doesn't live in the design system. Right? It lives at this sort of separate layer that's outside, but related to the actual design system. So that's one thing that happens. And then we also have this opportunity to still have sort of React wrappers or Angular wrappers or any sort of tech specific wrappers. Twig for like Drupal stuff. You go, oh yeah, like I want that global header to be in code and maybe I'm going to wire up the business logic and the state and all that good stuff there. It lives outside of the design system, but it's, all, it's, it's getting it closer to being actually being able to use, be used by these things kind of directly, right? And then also there could be sort of more product specific, right, sort of documentation that comes along for the ride. Like here's how we handle addresses for this product, or here's how we handle checkout, or here's how we handle these flows that might not apply to the whole organization, but they apply to, you know, a specific product, right? So we kind of have this like sort of intermediary layer. But really, when we get down to it, we're really just talking about design system and products, right? After it's all said and done, we have a design system that informs and influences how digital products get made. And the hope <laughs> is that those products, in turn, inform and influence how the system gets made, right? But this doesn't always happen, as I'm sure we know pretty well, right? Sometimes it's this, right? Especially as this sort of thing, as a design system, and oh, we have teams and we have all this stuff, right? And the design system team crawls up their ivory tower, looking down on the peons below, toiling away. How sad. How sad it must be down there, right? We will help them, yes, we will, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, the product designers are looking up at that ivory tower. Right. So that's a problem. And then there's the like pattern police. Da 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 da. Right. Thou shalt use this button component. Right. Exactly as we defined it. You will be fined five thousand dollars if you misuse this pattern. Right. And then there's the other. <laughs> The other side of this, which is hump, <laughs> the product just straight up eats the design system, right? Where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, standards, uh huh, sure, hump, right? I need this by next sprint, hump, <laughs> just big chomp, taking a big old bite out of that design system, and that's it's that, right? So getting this balance right is very hard, as we all know, right? And it's through, through this lens that this thing that I created almost 10 years to the day, in 10 days it'll be 10 years of atomic design. Hey, thank you. Thank you. This balancing act, this connection between the design system and the products that design system serves, right, was the whole reason in May of 2013 I created this methodology that sort of helps try to define how these itty bitty pieces all ultimately come together to form actual real working websites and apps, right? So atomic design is a mental model that helps connect and bridge together the worlds of design systems and the products they serve, right? Easily. One of the biggest things is I ducked my head into a bunch of different organizations, getting this balance uh, off 
is, is one of the, the sort of, you know, easily the, one of the most sort of frequent things that we see. Either the system is trying to strong arm too much the products, either the products are doing this or they're not talking to each other, they're trying to sort of make inroads. Getting this connection right is important. And that is the sort of birth of atomic design. I'd like to give a quick interlude. <laughs> Are you ready? I have a long running series called Just Another Day in Old Brad Frost's Inbox. And I would like to take you there. I would like you to, I would like to pull back the curtain and introduce you to the glorious world that is my inbox. Hi, Brad. I was wondering if you read mail with empty subjects. Hi, Brad. I feel like we're on a first name basis. I feel like I know you already. But on the other hand, you have no idea who I am, which is understandable, I guess. Who is this crazy guy, and why should you trust this email? Great question. This one's particularly brutal. Valerie is here, and I'm not going to get to start this freezing cold email with yet another COVID-related joke to get this through, because it's a pandemic already. Oh, no. Oh, no. I will instead get straight to business and ask whether you guys are accepting amazing contributions from the likes of me. Not too humble, I know. Sorry. P.S. I wrote this wearing, wearing a mask, so this email is 100% COVID free. Ugh. Ugh. I wanted to introduce my way in a way that showed I was interesting, witty, and clever. Alas, I wrote this email instead. I'm Ritesh. Before you ask, yes, I'm keenly aware of the irony of the situation. Are you receiving my emails? Sent from my iPhone. Please respond, Brad. Sorry to annoy you. I know you didn't respond to my opening gambit, Brad, but I remain determined to earn one because, well, I'd love the chance to work with you and Brad Frost. <laughs> Thus, this follow-up email. I'm going to do my utmost to follow up in a way that earns a response rather than your contempt. Hi, Brad. I haven't heard back from you despite my several attempts to contact you. I really start to worry. Please let me know if there's any way I can help or call 911. If my words have failed me, <laughs> it's time to unleash my secret weapon. I've attached a picture of a dog wearing a monocle. According to the internet, his name is Rufus. I trust that he will charm you into submission. That's creative. Hello, came across your website and have to tell you your banner image reminds me of my late grandmother's curtains. She lived in Pennsylvania too. Must be something in the water. Best regards. <laughs> Reading your article on React, I'm 57, been programming functional for 35 years. My faint brain physically rejected OO and .NET. Many years of embedded systems, blah, 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 SharePoint, SharePoint, SharePoint. I could expose you to the world of SharePoint. Worth some investment on my side. Hey, Brad, I'm old. With that comes a bit of knowledge, a smattering of applicable experience, way more aches and pains, and more relevant to this email than need for glasses. Brad, I have a web page that I need help with. The template is there and everything that goes with it, but I'm completely stumped when it comes to tech stuff. I'm a retired pre-press graphic artist, Mac operator. I hope it's OK that I scooped your Monopoly Photoshop file to use on my dead cat's public and not-for-profit Facebook site, Cheddar's Dreams. I do not advertise anything, and nothing is for sale. My aim is to educate and entertain while keeping my brain in shape. And yes, I did look it up, and that's the result. <laughs> well, she keep this short and crip. Uh, this was a misfire. This wasn't directed at me, but there will be no Taco Tuesday until further notice. There's another Brad that I, I, somehow I got roped in on somebody's like corporate email. It is a, it's a very sad one. 
Of course, these ones are always fun, right? This one is particularly good. Hello, Viable. My name is Undefined, and I worked with Undefined, uh, undefined as they're Undefined. <laughs> My team and I are looking to create Undefined that helps us Undefined. We would like to keep the project cost between Undefined and Undefined. We would like to complete this product by, uh, project by Undefined. Sincerely, Undefined, Undefined. And my God, my God, <laughs> my God, it is just people, 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 people are interesting, right? I'm the Guinness record holder. Ugh, I could go on literally all day, literally all day. But this one's pretty good. Hey, Brad, please read. Sounds like you know a lot about programming, but why do you not know how to spell Code Academy? You spelled it Code Academy. No wonder we have so many program programmers because people like you suck LMAO. <laughs> I know you're busy. So, oh yeah, so I updated the contact page on my website to try to cut down on this kind of stuff, right? I kind of like put up some guardrails a little bit that it's like, hey, contact me if you're, you know, not trying to spam the shit out of me, right? And uh, this person says, I know you're busy, we all are. Find your contact page to going a bit into the asshole area and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we used to do that too. I wanted to get in touch with you. I don't need your help or feedback. I don't expect to hear back from you. That would be totally not you. Hope you have a wonderful day with a few emails, right? Whew! Send me a book. Kidding, but not. I'm sure you have a number of freebies that you could spare. How about the one on your shelf? Frankly, I think you should send it to me for free right now. That's fun, right? The whole reason I bring this up is because I've been dealing with a decade, a decade of a bunch of random people emailing me to argue about the finer semantics of atomic design, right? So what's funny is that just even now, like today, you know, and like I still get issues on my GitHub. Here, let me see. Yeah, here we go. Pages to screens, right? This is like from a couple weeks ago, right? It's like, how about changing this from pages to screens, right? So all to say is like whenever there's all these like hot takes about atomic design being dead and all of this stuff, I hope you all understand that I'm like, I could care less. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to like raise a daughter, <laughs> you know? It's like, I don't give a shit what you call this stuff, right? Atomic design, <laughs> atomic design is a helpful mental model, but because I attached some language to it, that stuck is a good thing ultimately, but at the end of the day, uh, it's opened me up to a world of hurt. But yeah, so 10 years ago, you know, I was putting the finishing touches on our Pattern Lab website and sort of wanted to introduce atomic design. I'm going to quickly go through it as a little bit of a recap, but right? Every interface in the world can be exploded into its atomic pieces, right? Things like labels and inputs and buttons, but those aren't useful on their own. So we have to combine them together into these relatively simple components. And now all of a sudden we have a nice little functional thing. Relatively simple component I call molecule those molecules get combined into more complex components called organisms, right? Those co complex organisms form a discrete chunk of page that is relatively complex. Those things come together to join into a template, right? And a template is kind of like the scaffolding system or the skeletal system of any given user interface screen, right? But it's really at this stage that we're just kind of like showing how all of these different components hang together. And then at the page level, we take that sort of skeletal system, that template, and pipe real content and functionality and, and, and images into that thing. And this is the actual website or app that your users actually interact with, right? But this is also where we're sort of validating or invalidating you know, the effectiveness of the design system that's sort of powering this, right? So it's this ability to sort of do this and capture all the different states and do all of that stuff that allows us that creates a connection between the design system that we create and the products they serve, right? It accomplishes this harmony, it accomplishes this balance because if you were to change that accordion from blue to red or that button from blue to red or whatever it might be, you're able to sort of zoom out and sort of see the impact it has on your user interfaces.
Call it whatever you want. I don't give a shit. <laughs> right? This is cute. I love it. Right? Ingredients, recipes, entrees, templates, pages, cookbook. I like cookbook. It was really fun. Right? You get it, right? You understand my, my plight here, right? It's a mental model. It's not to be taken literally. Like, I get so many emails from teams that are like, I'm about to physically fight my developer. We are arguing over whether or not an icon with a button in it is a molecule or an atom, <laughs> and we would like you to settle a score. I'm like, please don't hurt each other. Please, please, please. There's so many bigger problems that we need to address. So call it whatever you want. Get off my case. So that kind of brings us to the present day, right? OK, we got this crazy design system ecosystem. We got atomic design still holding it down 10 years later. Where do we go from here? This is kind of what we've been talking about, right? This is what we're all up to. We got a design system. We got a bunch of products. We're trying to create a design system to power all of these different products. Here's the fun thing, though. <laughs> We're all doing it. Do you see the irony here? Right? You know how we're like, we're creating a source of truth for our interface at our company so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right? And then we come over from organization to organization to organization, and we're all building the same goddamn date picker the same goddamn accordion, the same goddamn text field. This is a problem. So I actually think we need a global design system. Why doesn't that exist? Food for thought. Get a beer in me later and we'll talk more about it. But I think that this is really interesting, right? Because it's like, well, isn't that what HTML is? We just need more stuff in HTML? No, I actually don't think so. Not necessarily, right? Because HTML is kind of like the low-level IKEA parts, right? The dowel rods, the, the screws, and the brackets, and all of that sort of stuff. And we're just like, we just dump it all out on a table, and we're like, go build dressers. Go build, go build beds. Good luck. And this is just heartbreaking, right? The WebAIM million is this thing that happens every year where they do a big accessibility audit of the world's top one million websites. And the numbers are always just stupidly depressing, right? It's like 96% of the top million web pages have critical accessibility issues. So we're clearly doing everything right, right? So what does it look like? What does it look like to actually try to sort of take some of our own pain away, right? All the stuff that we're doing at an organization level, why can't we do this at a global level? There's initiatives like Open UI, which my buddy Brian Cardell is a participant in. He's been at this for a long time. They've put together like a whole matrix of like popular design systems and the sort of hit rate right, of different components that are all shared across the board. And so this is a really great initiative, and admittedly, I haven't had the time to sort of jump into the frame myself, but I love the idea, right? Because if we're able to get this right, it means that we could create a date picker, <laughs> a text field. And if you want to grumble about accessibility, if you want to grumble about sort of certain features or whatever, like, you could fix it. <laughs> and fix it for like every developer on the planet. That would be cool, right? Of course, this thing could be like, you know, sort of skinnable and themable. And if it doesn't do what you need it to do, if it doesn't get all of your special snowflake syndrome solved, you could still cut the cord and do it the old fashioned way. But the rest of us pragmatic people will be using what comes out of the box, right? Does that sound good? That sounds like a pretty commonsensical, no brainer kind of a thing. But it has everything to do with like how it's positioned, how it's designed, how it's working. So this is just like a little bit of like a, a crude, you know, sort of like look at what this could look like. What, you know, W3C, right? That's a good organization that, you know, kind of 
houses the standards for all of the internet. So something like that, right? I'm not saying that this is this like pure speculative, but just to give some examples, right? Button group, okay, with the buttons. These things are just all, all the same. Like let's let's stop doing this work. And of course, it wouldn't be a conference in May 2023 if we didn't talk about AI. So let's do it. I'm sure I'm not the first one, or sure won't be the last one of the day, right? Uh, the team at Zero Height wanted to create a zine for this event and asked me to participate, and so this is what I drew. Let's talk about this. 1991 to present day, this is how we've been doing things. Human beings making websites, right? But now, we got this guy in the mix, right? Here we go. This is going to get fun pretty quickly. I'd like you to introduce you to my good friend and colleague, Kevin Coyle. Kevin works with us at Big Medium. We work on a bunch of different client design systems. He's also just gotten super into AI. This is him with his dogs, and he sent me several pictures of his dogs, so I decided to give them their own space as well. Look at them, they're beautiful. That looks like an oil painting. <laughs> but here's Kevin. I want to just kind of show you what we've been working on at Big Medium to help our clients wield AI to help make and maintain design systems. And of course it's not going to play. Let's try. Nope. Do, 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 do. We're going to do this another way. Okay. You wouldn't get that if you just put that into GPTs. Hey. All right. I think by now everyone and their dog has used tools such as ChatGPT and Bar to help them solve problems. These problems might be programming related, or they could just be something mundane like making a recipe for dinner. But one thing that I've noticed when using it is that it often lacks the full context of the project or the problem that you're trying to solve. You can't just paste in a full code base inside GPT's chat window and expect it to consume it. It just can't take that much information at once. So what I have done, I've whipped up a short example here using some tooling that condenses an entire code base plus its documentation into a format that GPT-4 can understand. I've been set a problem by Brad and he wants me to create a, an alert component that has some variants and that has a prop called is dismissible. I thought I'd use this tool to make it a bit faster for me. So I've given it this prompt here and let's see the code that it produces. So it's given me a nice little tutorial. It hasn't given me the full solution. Um, I can engineer my prompt to do that better in the future, I think. But let's have a look at it. It uses the base class that we use throughout the code base of DS element, and that's unique to our code base here. It uses a custom prefix here of DS. You wouldn't get that if you just put that into GPT's chat GPT's text window. It's using the format here that we use across all of components in this library. It's created some classes and it's created some pretty good markup. So all in all, I think this has done 80% of the work for me. This isn't all we've used this for though. We have used this for other things such as accessibility audits, creating documentation, and we've even been experimenting in creating bespoke tutorials for individuals to help them with the ways that they learn and just to make it easier for everyone. So this is what we've done with it so far. And I think the possibilities are, are really expanding with it. And we've only just scratched the surface. It's really exciting. So that's Kevin showing how we can train AI, these large language models, to absorb our design systems conventions and then just splat out a bunch of components in the exact same shape as the rest of our design system. I need an accordion that has these options. I need an alert with a success variant, error variant, warning variant, and an option to make it dismissible and have that sort of spit out an X button that could close the alert. 
<laughs> this is kind of cool, Brad. I like this a lot. This is really neat. Right? How does this make you feel? I'm sure we've all seen other demos and other things where it's just like, yeah, you know, this stuff is coming, right? You have things like Midjourney that could like paint a fantastical world in like 0.2 seconds, right? Sure as shit could spit out a bootstrap site, right? It's okay. What do we do with this? Well, here's the thing. Everybody's going to be doing this. And that's a problem. These are very recent articles, right? 90% of online content could be generated by AI by 2025. I don't doubt that for a second. These things don't sleep. 2013 was an interesting year for me. I created another project called Death to Bullshit. That began as a talk, just like this one that I end up turning into a website. And that website looks like this, and it's very sort of simple. But to articulate the point, I had a turn bullshit on <laughs> button that sort of showcase a lot of the really sort of glorious <laughs> user interface patterns. And the basic gist behind this, right, <laughs> as I define bullshit, superfluous or unnecessary, cluttered, clunky, or needlessly complex, intentionally deceptive or insincere, and of course the original definition of bullshit, which is the excrement of an adult male bovine mammal. In my talk, a reference Sturgeon's Law. If you're not familiar with Sturgeon's Law, Theodore Sturgeon was a science fiction author, and he was asked the question, he says, why, why is 90% of all science fiction writing crap? And he says, well, when you think about it, 90% of everything is crap. It's a very peculiar that that 90% of online content being generated by AI by 2025 happened to also be 90%, right? So, here we are, and here's what I think needs to happen. I, I think it's inevitable that these AI tools become part of our toolkit, and I don't think that we should shy away from, from using them in typical Luddite fashion. I think that, yeah, these are really great tools to make our workflows more efficient, create stronger products, all of that good stuff, right? So, of course that makes sense. But I think that what we also need to do is really ensure that we aren't just taking this shit at face value, right? We need to be on the other side of it. And this is where our skills, our fundamentals, but also our humanity is becoming more and more and more and more and more important. And here's the thing, this process takes longer than this process, right? This is what everybody's going to be doing because it's the easy path, it's the automatic path. This is the project, project that we need to embark on collectively, individually. We are human beings. We weren't put on this earth to draw rectangles, to handcraft alert components. We are here to solve problems and make the world better and use our full human potential, our talents, our abilities, not the boxes, the professional boxes we get put in but even the boxes around our certain hobbies and our side hustles and all of that stuff, right? All of those conventions. You are a really special person. As Mr. Rogers says, there's no one like you. 
I think it really matters in this moment in time to really capture this moment of this kind of uncertainty, a lot of the dread that comes with AI and sort of just how quickly this is all raining down on us. I think that this is a real important inflection point for us to help the world understand how we can, yes, use these tools, but use them responsibly. Use them to elevate humanity instead of destroy it, <laughs> or at least detract from it, right? In my work, I encounter people just caught in these giant dehumanizing traps, whether that's safe agile or a JIRA board or offshore teams just being barked at by project managers in the States. So many of our processes, these Tayloristic kind of crappy, rigid, dehumanizing things, is not what we should be doing with our time on Earth, right? Just as we shouldn't be building the same freaking web component <laughs> date picker again and again and again and again and again. How do we free up our time, our talents, and our abilities to solve the world's wicked problems? These are the things that our smart human brains should be embarking on. So as AI eats into all of our day-to-day -day job, I want you to contemplate and ask yourself, what if I wasn't drawing rectangles for a living? What if that's not what I'm actually here to do? What could I do with my whole self to make the world better? And I genuinely believe that. We all have the capabilities and the talents and the potential to do that. And I think that this is the moment in time to really embrace it. So thank you all.